we're going to go ahead and get started since it is 632 and want to get everybody out of here on time. We appreciate you coming out uh, on a weekday night to be with us. I'm um, Jennifer Roberts. I am one of the organizers for tonight. I'm the former mayor of Charlotte and a former county, commission, uh, county commissioner for Mecklenburg County. Uh, and my colleague who's been helping organize is Bob Orr. I'm going to introduce him in a minute. Uh, and on behalf of the Carter Center and our North Carolina Coalition for Trusted Elections, we want to thank you for coming to hear from our election experts about fair, safe, and secure elections in North Carolina. I also have to take a minute to thank our um, co-organizers and other um, groups that have really helped us get the word out, uh, helped us get speakers, and that would be the League of Women Voters, North Carolina, who are, you saw outside, yes, give them all hands. They're bipartisan, they work very hard to get people accurate information about voting and encourage voting and participation in our democracy. Um, we also have as a partner the U.S. Veterans Hall of Fame. I understand there are several veterans in the office. Thank you for your service. If you were a veteran, raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, and they work to get resources to veterans, and of course they help them with voting resources as well. Um, the last partner I want to mention because we have uh, a town hall that's online, and it was done last night by the Reimagining America Project. And if you go to their YouTube page and scroll down, I think one or two, you'll see uh, Tim Boyum. Um, and that's the video we did last night with Tim Boyum as moderator. So you can listen to all 90 minutes of that with Michael Dickerson and G.K. Butterfield and a bunch of other uh, experts um, if you want to hear all this again. <laughs> um, so, you know, millions of Americans continue to be concerned uh, about the legitimacy of the 2020 election. There was concerns about 2016. And the Carter Center has bringing its expertise in supporting democracy around the world to help uh, support our democracy and to help restore confidence in our election process. Um, they have seen countries that are challenged in their democracies and they have expertise, but what we're doing in North Carolina is local. So that's why Bob and I have been hired to help organize um, this cross-partisan network um, of leaders around the state and also this 15 uh, event town hall tour. Um, we were chosen among all the states along with three other states, Florida, part of Florida, Georgia, and Arizona as a pilot project to work to get ahead of the misinformation to help restore confidence and um, the reason is that we are a swing state. We have important elections in the fall we also have a history of some disruptions in mobilization. So um, hopefully we'll be leaders in this and we'll be able to work in 2024, again, to make sure we have that hallmark of democracy, the peaceful transfer of power. So um, with that, let me introduce you to my colleague, um, Justice Bob Orr, who has served on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Uh, he graduated from UNC Chapel Hill, both undergrad and uh, law school. He served in the U.S. Army, and he served uh, for more than a decade on our highest court as a North Carolina Supreme Court Justice. Join me in welcoming Bob Orr. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, I have to say it's been a great honor and privilege to work with Jennifer in the Carter Center on this project. It's I think it's vital in so many ways to uh, sustaining our democracy. Uh, you got to be really uh, an Asheville old timer if you remember Jack Cole, who was a banker and was involved with the Smith McDowell House and Western North Carolina Historical Association. But Jack would always start his remarks by noting that Moses climbed to the top of Mount Pisgah and gazed down upon the promised land. <laughs> And so I am delighted to be back home in the promised land. Uh, I want to spend just a couple of minutes to sort of set the stage and, and, and the framework for 
tonight's conversation, but also about this project. So it was in December of 1776, about 325 miles east of here, that the framers of the North Carolina Constitution met in Halifax to establish for the very first time a representative democracy for the people of this state. A foundational principle of their efforts is set out in the Declaration of Rights was a system of elections. Now, over the course of these last 246 years, that foundational concept of elections by the people has undergone enormous changes, changes that have strengthened and expanded the voting franchise, provided greater security for the electoral process, and expanded the scope of public officials that we elect. The democratic principle of election by the people is the fundamental foundation upon which our government and our democracy are built. Today we have over 7,345,000 registered voters across the 100 counties of this state. We have professional staffers hired at the state level and local professional staffers hired by each county election of board to administer those elections. And in an election year, some 25,000 other individuals of all political persuasions, our friends and our neighbors, work the polls over the course of the election period. The professional staff handles candidate filings and the preparation of ballots, while these non-staff individuals assist with pre-election day activities like early voting absentee ballot requests and submissions, in addition to election day voting and the tabulation of votes, all of which leads to the certification of the election results. These Herculean tasks are accomplished within a framework of laws enacted over the years by the North Carolina legislature and regulations consistent with those laws as enacted by the State Board of Elections. A comprehensive set of security measures are in place to protect the right to vote and the accurate tabulation of those votes to determine election winners. And specific legal procedures are in place to allow challenges and complaints if any citizen feels that a violation of the law has taken place. Now many people may take voting for granted, but as former President Dwight D. Eisenhower said, the future of this republic is in the hands of the American voter. Our election officials, from Murphy to Manio, from Boone to Beaufort, from Charlotte to Shalote, work relentless to make sure that our elections, so vital to American democracy, proceed fairly, safely, and securely. And tonight, we're going to hear how they work to make that happen. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce a gentleman who needs no introduction, Dr. Chris Cooper of Western Carolina University, the Robert Lee Madison Distinguished Professor and Director of the Public Policy Institute at Western. But Chris's reach isn't just in Western North Carolina. All across the state, Chris has interviewed as an expert in elections and public policy and nationally. And so uh, Chris is a great resource for our region, a great friend. He's got a great Twitter following. So uh, please welcome. Definitely not deserving of all that stuff. Um, just want to say welcome, and we're going to do. A lot of introductions here as we get going. I want to thank some media partners. We've got folks from WPBM, we got folks from Blue Ridge Public Radio, we have folks here from WLOS. So thanks for spreading the word. Um, also want to thank some folks that are either current elected officials or running for office, or uh, in one case both, uh, who happen to be here today. So Preston Blakely, can you stand up, Preston, real quick? Preston is Mayor Fletcher, and he's here today. We want to thank him for being here. Um, you can definitely get Preston around the block. And a former student, that's right. Preston passed my stats class, which I appreciate. So that's uh, with flying colors. Lindsey Prather, who's right next to him, who's running for North Carolina General Assembly for the House. 
also pass stats. And then, uh, and then right in front we have Chuck Edwards, who of course is in the North Carolina State Senate and is running for NC11 um, uh, for Congress. So welcome. <laughs> Great to have everybody here. It's particularly, I think, really great that we've got Democrats, we've got Republicans, we've got elected officials, we have folks running for office. And I think that really shows and embodies the spirit of what, uh, what we're trying to accomplish today. So just to give you a quick run of show, we're going to do it's like three different panels today. Um, and we're going to start off with a panel of one. Uh, so I don't know if that's a panel or I don't know what exactly that is, but uh, it's going to be a good one. And we're going to start off with our cybersecurity panel. So we're going to run this for, uh, for about 20 minutes. So uh, everybody, please welcome Mark Seelenbacher. He's a career IT and cybersecurity professional serving the local government of Henderson County. Um, his name is Mark Seelenbacher, and uh, he's also associated with the North Carolina Government Information Systems Association Cyber Strike Team. That sounds impressive to me, uh, which is a core member of the Joint Cyber Security Task Force. And thanks so much for being here, Mark, and uh, yeah, let us understand more about uh, about the cybersecurity piece of this. And so we're going to do the cybersecurity panel. We're going to then move into an election administration panel, and then we'll have an election law panel. Bob Orr will come back out for that. So the um, way it'll work is I'll start off with some questions. We really want to encourage questions from, um, I don't want to call you the audience, from the participants, the folks who came out today. So I believe Jennifer Roberts or David Capen or Bob Orr will be running around getting some questions after a while. Um, but I'll start off with some of my own sort of selfish questions. Um, so I think one thing on people's minds is, uh, is just how secure are voting machines. So can someone hack into a voting machine? And what about the county or state website where voting tallies are reported, Mark? Okay, um, so it's a very complicated answer. The short answer is yes. Voting machines are just another computer, so they can be hacked like any other computer. Um, however, that said, they, in order to hack a system, it has to be connected to something, usually. And uh, the tabulating machines in use for most every county that, uh, that I'm familiar with, the uh, ES, ES and S, DS uh, 200s now, mm -hmm. and um, they are completely kept completely offline. So. Short answer is yes. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but uh, it, it would be extremely, extremely difficult to do. Okay, great. Um, so to move to one example that I've certainly heard people talk about, I'm sure others have too, um, would it be possible for the Russians or some other government to come in and change the outcome of an election by hacking into our state a board of election site? Mm, no. <laughs> um, so, one thing that needs to be emphasized, I think, is that is the fact that um, the cyber element of an election, whether it's a tabulating machine or the the thumb drives that hold the, the the votes, is a small piece of the election's process. Um, there, and I'm, I'm not wanting to get too far into the administrative side of the uh, the checks and balances and, and, and reconciliation process that happens, um, but. The votes are tabulated on the DS-200, and there is a USB drive that stores that information. Um, and then when it's brought back into the uh, office after election night, uh, it is offloaded onto a completely, again, disconnected system that, um, that is like offline completely. Um, and then it is transferred over once again, and, and at each step of this process, there are checks to, to make sure that the counts that the tabulating, tabulating machine has match uh, all the paper trail that goes along with it. Um, and then finally, it's uploaded to the State Board of Elections website or State Board of Elections system, which is then presented as election night returns on the website. The website itself is a completely separate system than where the votes are actually stored and, and kept uh, at the State Board. Great. I think that's a, a, a very, very important point about which, where things are separate and where they're together. And to sort of remind um, around myself, uh, this is from the audience, but also remind panelists and forthcoming panelists to make sure to speak up, make sure the folks in the back of the room can hear. Um, 
sort of the, the other side of this, sometimes we hear people saying, well, look, why don't we vote on the internet? Or why don't we vote on our phones? Or why is voting so hard? Sort of the opposite of the security angle that we've been hearing about. So would internet voting or voting on our phones be more secure? Would it be secure? Well, this, one thing that you have to keep in mind is that uh, with these, with the tabulating machines that are in use across the state today, um, they are, they go through a certification process both at the federal level and at the state level. So these are certified machines and, uh, and that, is, that is the point at which the votes counted. So um, it's much more difficult to put to place controls on individual cell phones or personal devices or things like that uh, like they have on these tabulating machines. So could it be possible in the future? Maybe. Would it be more secure? Probably not. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. What, what kinds of measures should be in place to protect a state website from being hacked or shut down? And, and sort of what is the most secure place for voters to get this kind of information? There are several, uh, well, there are quite a few uh, measures that need to be uh, taken to keep the website itself secure. Uh, typically things like uh, making sure um, no other services that are not being used on this on the system is uh, are, are uh, running no other ports that shouldn't be open or that are left open um, one really important one is a web application firewall which is a essentially a, a system that filters all requests coming through uh, the internet to the website and responds and it, it effectively blocks any sort of malicious code that might be uh, that someone might try to pass along to the web server. Great. That's that's fantastic. Thanks. And can you you mentioned ES and S before. Yes. So for those folks who dork out on elections a lot, which I would certainly count myself as one that, that I know what that means. But we have folks in the room who may know less about it. So can you describe a little bit kind of who this ESS, ES and S is, what the different kinds of vendors are out there, and what these machines really look like in practice? Okay, uh, so ES and S is election system and systems and software? That's right. Software? Okay. Um, uh, and again, forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm an IT guy. I'm not a, an elections person, so. Um, <laughs> Uh, so a tabulating machine is, is basically just a computer, a specialized computer that has a, uh, a scanner and it has, it, it uh, is able, it, the newer ones have, do have a touchscreen display, um, but it's effectively like, looks like a flatbed scanner. Um, and the ballots that you see, uh, there, there are two styles of ballots. One is a, is a standard paper ballot that everyone, everyone who votes has used it. Uh, the other style is a, is a uh, one that is used in uh, what used to be the AutoMark, but is now called Express Vote. Express Vote. Thank you very much. Uh, Express Vote is is a uh, is all it does is mark a ballot, and it, it prints out the the ballot for the tabulating machine to be to be fed into the tabulating machine. So essentially, it reads these these tick marks, and it looks for the uh, the mark of the bubble where the vote whoever the voter fills in, and it counts the uh, uh, the vote that way. Now, it, they are, the programming allows it to be smart enough to detect if there is an overvote, that is, uh, if, you're only, if you're only supposed to vote for one candidate and you vote for two or three or whatever, and it'll kick that out. Um, or it will, it will it, it'll kick it out, or depending on, on, on the situation, it'll kick it out or it will, it gives you the option to go ahead and, and accept it. Great, sorry. No, that's fantastic. We're getting, Excellent assistance from uh, from our election administration panel will be coming up. We actually have yeah. the, the Henderson County uh, Board of Elections chair here, so we're we're excited to see here. And I think we've got a couple of cybersecurity questions. So, what happens to voting machines or tabulators that are accessed by unauthorized personnel? What happens to voting machines or tabulators that are accessed by unauthorized personnel? I honestly don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know who is not, who would be an authorized personnel. Well, I, I guess maybe a better way to approach that might be how do we how do we know who is getting access to the machines? They are kept. Okay, so the, that I can answer. Uh, the tabulating machines are kept under lock and key and only at, at our local boards of elections. Um, they are always continuously tested. 
um, before an election, and I, again, I, I'm kind of getting into the administrative side of it, but I don't want to step on, on uh, the next panel's toes at all. Um, and they can explain the process by which these machines are uh, set up and tested prior to an election and a mock election and things like that. Um, but they are kept under lock and key, and, and only Board of Election staff have access to them. Great. So a similar kind of question. Um, how do you know the machines have no problems, somebody asked? How do you know the machines have no problems? We have um, someone on the on the election staff. Typically, prior to an election, will go through um, and test, run a test script. Well, number one, we we have the mock election process, um, and they run a test script, and they know what the uh, out the expected output should be. And when they run the ballots through, they compare the what the uh, tabulator reading gives them to the expected outputs. So that's one way that, that we verify that uh, the, the tabulating machines work as expected. Great. So can you maybe just for sort of a final question for this panel and then we'll get the election administration panel up. Talk to us a little bit about, and with the understanding you're not a, an elections professional, you wear many hats in, in IT and in cybersecurity with Henderson County, but tell us from your perspective how the how Henderson County or any county communicates with the State Board of Election. In other words, how do these results get from Henderson County, Buncombe County, Madison County to Raleigh? Okay. Um, so again, all these machines are offline. None of them are connected. None of them are networked. None, none of them have modems. Um, um, so uh, the all this, the, the programming and the uh, vote counts are stored on a USB thumb drive, just like you would use at home. Uh, well, not just like you would use at home. Um, they are encrypted thumb drives. Um, but they are, they, they look like a standard thumb drive. Um, and after polls close and uh, the chief judges do their thing and close down the polls, uh, they're brought back to the, the Board of Elections office. They're then uh, offloaded, the data is offloaded to a, uh, an isolated system uh, that is then, I'm, I'm, I'm getting in the weeds here on this one, um, is offloaded to a, a completely uh, air gap system and um, the data is then transferred, is, is checked then, transferred to a third system where it's then uploaded to the state and it's, it, is, uh, through, it is through a web interface I believe that's uploaded. Great. And so we actually did get one more, so thank you for whoever gave the last question here. Um, the question is written, what keeps you up at night? And I'm going to restrict you to election security when you're answering this question. So if this is like Vols football, we don't want to hear about it. Um, what keeps you up at night? Uh, I don't get much sleep. <laughs> uh, let's see. There are, I got to be honest with you, election security is not in North Carolina. Election security is one of them, one thing that keeps me up at night. Uh, the process is, is, I've been in local government and I, IT for over 20 years. I've worked elections for most of those years, um, supporting on the technology side. We have a fantastic process. We really do. Uh, it is solid and um, so, that said, the things that keep me up at night, um, somewhere, misconfiguration of systems, uh, that one thing that you thought you had covered, you just didn't. <laughs> uh, those are the sorts of things that keep me up. Great. I think that's fantastic. So thank you very much, Mark, for, for being here. I think Mark's going anywhere, so nobody needs to phone a friend later on. We can have our cybersecurity expert. Um, so I'll call up our, our panelists for election administration. Um, one at a time, which is a really extraordinary tool they've developed in Buncombe County. So Corinne is here. Where we? There she is. Okay. And Karen Hebb, the aforementioned phone a friend, is here. Uh, she currently serves as the director of elections for Henderson County. She became working for Henderson County Board of Elections in 1986, as she told me before, is when she was 12 years old. She was hired full time in 1995 and became director in 2019. 
For the last 36 years, Ms. Head has done every job, from packing supplies to programming equipment. With decades of experience at every level, she can honestly say that our elections processes and procedures are the most secure they've ever been, which is an extraordinary statement for somebody who's been in the field as long as she has. Uh, Charles, or Charlie Med, is here today as well, um, and hopefully he'll come up. He was appointed by Governor Roy Cooper in 2019 to serve as chair of the Henderson County Board of Elections. He's a retired Henderson County school teacher who served in the U.S. Navy and Reserves for 40 years. And last but certainly not least, Jake Quinn is here today. Jake Quinn is, oh, actually, hold on, I got another, I got a new and improved bio for Jake Quinn. <laughs> After retiring from a career with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and escaping the Beltway for Asheville in 2005, Mr. Quinn slowly became engaged in the local political scene here. He learned a lot about his new community from knocking doors across Buncombe in the fall of 2006 and enjoyed the experience. He became chair of his precinct a few months later, got more deeply involved over time, ultimately holding leadership positions at the local, state, and national levels. He represented North Carolina Democrats on the Democratic National Committee from 2012 to 2016 and helped lead North Carolina's delegation in Philadelphia at the 2016 National Convention. He retreated from partisan politics after the 2016 election cycle to focus his activity on electoral issues. He participated in the North Carolina League of Women's Voters partisan gerrymandering lawsuit that was decided at the U.S. Supreme Court in 2019 and served as a witness in other voting rights lawsuits. He has, uh, had a long, he has long been a client of election services as a voter and as a campaign treasurer and operative and was a regular attendee at county board elections meetings before being appointed to serve as a member of the Buncombe County Board of Elections in 2018. He was appointed board chair by Governor Cooper in 2019. So obviously this is an incredibly knowledgeable panel. If you came in uh, just a few minutes ago, first welcome. Uh, the way we're doing this is I'll begin with a few questions, but we're encouraging questions for everybody who's here in the room. So Jennifer Roberts is walking around uh, in a very nice purple, I think, for the Catamounts uh, jacket as she's collecting questions. So I'll begin, um, really anybody who wants to grab this one. Many North Car uh, Carolina residents have questions about the integrity of our voting system. One concern is with same-day registration. How are these new registrants checked to make sure they are residents and legal citizens before their votes get counted? So if they're same-day registration, they show up, how are they checked? How do we know who they are? Thanks for the question. Uh, when someone presents themselves during early voting to register before they vote, they have to be able to prove who they are, and they need to be able to prove that they live at an address in our jurisdiction. They need to bring in physical evidence of that. Within two days of that registration, we send out a postcard to the voter at the address at which they just registered. If we get that postcard back, we wonder, are they really there? And we send another one. But we use that process to verify everybody who registers to vote during early voting. Anybody have anything to add to that? It's a great one. Great. So this is kind of a fun one. I have some different questions that, that have been asked in different forums. And so I was looking at them and thinking, okay, which ones work for us here today? Um, this is what happens if a hurricane occurs on voting day. I'm going to change that up a little if it's all right. Um, but in all seriousness, what happens when some sort of natural disaster does occur? So right, I'm thinking about uh, what happened in Haywood County. What happens if something like that occurs on election day? So I don't know if one of our directors wants to grab that. Okay. Um, we send backups in all of our supplies. Uh, if they can't use their computers, they have a paper backup all the voters that are registered in their precinct. We have paper ATV forms. We have paper ballots. So if for some reason they can't get into the polling location to actually open the polls at 630, they can always sit up in the parking lot if they have to and vote the people there. So we have already made uh, provisions for uh, any type of emergency that we hope never happens. And if I could add to that, oh. Go ahead, ladies first. <laughs> I like this, I hope that we're all chiming in on things. Um, yeah. So we do a lot of emergency preparedness things um, previous to uh, everything that Karen said is, uh, is absolutely true as well. So 
we try to make sure there's wide awareness for all of the different teams that, that could help during any type of emergency. Uh, so we make sure that we do that, and we also make sure that everyone understands all of their options for voting so that um, if a storm is on the way, uh, and might hit election day, that there are, are options for people to go and vote early too. <coughs> <laughs> I like it. All right. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about mail voting. Something that's become increasingly common in the state of North Carolina. Obviously, with the pandemic, it looks like they probably won't be as high as they were last time, mail voting numbers, but still probably up more than what we saw in 2018. How do y'all handle mail voting? How does mail voting, what's kind of mail voting 101 for those in the room who are trying to understand the process? start with that. Um, we do have a lot of mail, uh, voting by mail in Henderson County. And so once we receive a valid request, then we process that, we mail the ballot to the voter. Once we get the ballot back, um, then it goes through the process of our office, reviews all of those. Uh, then we have a board meeting and our five-member board <coughs> reviews all of the absentee ballots to make sure that there is a signature by the voter, there are two witnesses, and um, everything is re that's required is on that envelope. At that time, if it's approved, then we open the, uh, the envelope, we run the ballots through the machine, we do not tabulate, we just run them through the machine, and then we document, document, document. We, we keep track of every ballot that comes in that is approved or disapproved. So we keep a log of all the ballots at every meeting that's run through, beginning before the meeting and after the meeting, then the uh, tabulator is stored in a locked, secure room, and the ballots are not tabulated until election day, and then they're not reported until 7.30 that night. So there are reports from uh, our computer system for every mailed ballot, and once the ballot is approved, then that record for that voter is flagged as voting. So that eliminates uh, them going to a one-stop site and attempting to vote, or on election day, because their record is already flagged as voted. Anybody else want to jump in on that? It was a great rundown. And we don't allow anyone to collect ballots harvesting. I might add that every single night, the North Carolina State Board of Elections updates the voter file once the, the during early voting, once the uh, the votes are are registered in the system, and that data is available every single day online at the North Carolina State Board of Elections website. And you can download the state's full voter file. And you can, you can look up everything yourself. You can look up your own ballot. It is a huge set of data. But one of the incredible strengths of the elections infrastructure in this state is its transparency and the fact that the state puts voluminous information online every single day so anyone who's interested, anyone who wants to monitor it, can go grab that data. They don't have to ask for it, it's there. Uh, it's a big strength. And I think it adds to the, to the security of the process overall. And I think that the talk louder was directed at me, so I'll try that. I think it was in all of us. <laughs> Jake's the loud one, I'm the quiet one. Um, <laughs> The only thing that I would add is that, just to remind everyone, that those board meetings where the ballots are reviewed are public. So anyone can come and view that process and watch any of the discussions that board members have over certain ballots. And, um, and so that, that's just another safeguard in the system. That's great. These are great questions that are coming in. I'm going to uh, take a little uh, moderator's discretion here. Uh, Charlie mentioned ballot harvesting. He said, we don't have any ballot harvesting. My guess is there's some folks in the room who might sort of vaguely be familiar with that word but not really know what it means. So I was wondering, can you just, what is ballot harvesting and why were you so quick to say we don't do it? 
because it's been in the news. <laughs> well, the term actually explains itself, harvest. You knock on your neighbor's door or subdivision and you take their ballots from them, uh, their mail-in ballots, uh, their absentee ballots. By the way, that envelope is called a container envelope. One thing I would like to stress, and I wish the state board would correct it, is that we have too many different terms for the same thing. One-stop voting, early voting, absentee voting. Every vote that, or every uh, ballot that is voted before the actual election day, are you listening, is an absentee ballot. Do you hear what? It's an absentee ballot. I taught school, got that? A, okay. So we don't allow harvesting and uh, we need to get our terms unified. And um, you know, we also, in North Carolina, absentee ballots have to be requested by the voter and returned by the voter. So those are two other safeguards that uh, help uh, ensure that uh, these kind of activities don't happen. That's great, great addition. Um, someone in the audience asked, can you please explain what a provisional ballot is and how it's processed? We, we can trade off. Okay. <laughs> Tag team. So provisional voting is a, a form of, it's, a, it's ba basically a fail-safe form of voting. So this is uh, offered any time that there is an issue at, uh, at a voting location that a, a poll worker can't solve. And that is put in place so that, uh, to make sure that everyone who is eligible to vote gets that opportunity. and. Also, if that person was not eligible to vote, that vote does not get counted. And so uh, an example of provisional voting would be uh, someone comes to a polling location on election day and they didn't get registered on time. So they're not uh, uh, seen in the uh, registration database. Um, but that person will be offered a provisional ballot and then researched. Those are heavily researched at our office. Afterwards, to make sure there uh, there was no uh, that they didn't attempt to register at the DMV, and, and, uh, and we have all kinds of places that we look and research these things, uh, and then that gets presented to our board after canvas, and, uh, and and it's adjudicated whether those ballots are counted in that election or not. So it's a safeguard to make sure that only the people who are eligible to vote uh, get counted, and, uh, and and that nobody gets left. But every single provisional ballot that is cast is researched. Now, in November, Election Day will be on Tuesday the 8th, and we will announce official final results. On the 18th, 10 days later, we'll, we'll see preliminary results on Election Day. But the official results don't occur for another 10 days, and that is because Election Services staff needs that time to do a number of things, including research, the hundreds of provisional ballots that are cast in every election. In Buncombe County, we get hundreds of provisional ballots, and I can imagine jurisdictions such as Wake and Mecklenburg look at staggering numbers. But that 10-day period is perhaps the single most busy period of election services. And election day is over. But I'll tell you, those provisional ballots require a ton of attention and research because we want to make sure that every eligible voter who has cast a ballot has their vote count. I'd just like to add that um, when we train our poll workers, uh, if there's an issue at the polling location and they can't make a, a decision about whether someone is registered or someone is not, don't ever turn a voter away. Uh, offer a provisional ballot. That gives us time to go back to the office. We can research. I hate to admit it, but sometimes even we make mistakes. Uh, you know, it could be an office error. It could be a, a, a simple thing like the voter uh, was registered in Buncombe County but moved to Henderson County and doesn't even realize that they now live in Henderson County. You know, something like that. But we do offer that to every single voter that comes into the polling location. Great. 
that's where the mayor of Fletcher could help us out. You know, when they move back and forth across the line, we'd appreciate it, Mayor. Good, good, good to get some good-natured lobbying while we're here. This is great. Um, there's a whole lot of good questions here, and I think I'm seeing some similar themes develop. This is one that I'm seeing a, a lot around. If there are people concerned about the security of electronic voting, is it possible to go back to an all-paper process? Would that be any more or less secure, or any other concerns that make this less viable? We all want that. We all want that. Well, why, why don't we let everybody do it? What, let's, let's start on this end of the table and move down then. That's great. Please. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, okay. So, uh, of course, we could go uh, back to completely all paper, um, but the electronic piece of things, we, we, paper is the basis of voting in North Carolina. Uh, the electronic side of the system is just to augment and make things faster and make auditing uh, uh, auditing more accurate. Um, and I think other people will want to say more, but uh, but that's why we have you know people want results quickly and accurately, and the machines help us do that. There were about five and a half million ballots cast in the state of North Carolina in the 2020 election. Does anyone have any idea how long it would take to count five and a half million ballots by hand? Understanding that on each ballot, you are looking at multiple races. So there's the time factor. Now let's get to the human factor. I, mean, I love people, but they are not nearly as adept and accurate at tabulating vast quantities of data as machines that were designed for that task. So if you want it done accurately, and if you want it done quickly, we don't have any alternative that I can see. Um, I was just thinking about the um, hand-to-eye recount that we had in 2020 for the Newbie and Beasley race. And just the simple logistics of getting enough people to come into our office as a multi-partisan team and do hand-eye recount of just 3% of our precincts. I cannot imagine how long it would take us to get all of our ballots tallied by hand, and they would never be correct, never. You could not expect it to be correct because we're human, we make mistakes, especially when you're tired. So it would take weeks to get the results. Is anybody willing to wait weeks before they get the results? They're calling us before 7.30, so yeah. So you think about it that way. It, it, Shirley, we wanna hear everything, but if y'all can talk about what a hand-eye recount is. My guess is there's some people in the room who don't know what a hand-eye recount is. So, you wanna hear it? Watch me be corrected. <laughs> uh, I saw one. It was the uh, Sherry Beasley newbie recount. Uh, the state board said that we would do this because, uh, well, I'll, go, I'll do it real fast. Right? What is it? It's where you actually take the ballot. You have a, 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 a bipartisan group, Republican and Democrat. They sit down. They have a stack of, believe it or not, it's, it's I was going to say this that the last question, it is a paper ballot. You put a piece of paper in the machine, it prints the ballot, you take it out, you look at it, you put it in a tabulator, that's paper, 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 paper. One thing you need to do, and I'm off the subject, is you need to review your ballot. We get so many people don't review their ballot, and then they complain. Okay, hand to eye, you got a stack of ballots. You have what? You have four people at a table, two Democrats, two Republicans, and that's it. One calls out the vote, Beasley. One person takes that piece of paper and says to herself, yeah, he called it out right. The other two people mark it down, Beasley, Beasley, okay? Uh, one for newbie. Yeah, that was right, call it newbie. Newbie, newbie, and that's what it is. And then you tally it up. And speaking for Henderson County, I can't speak for Buncombe County, we were dead on. <laughs> <laughs>
No, it makes you feel good because people are, yeah. oh, you lost the ballot. Do you realize in that uh, uh, election cycle, I mean, the counting of the ballots, that she only needed, she was 401 votes behind. We have 100 counties. Divide that into four. All she needed was four votes per county, and we would be into another situation. That's how accurate that count was. She didn't call for one. Fantastic. That's great, great answers. Thanks for rolling with me on the, on the further explanation there. So I've <laughs> got a, um, a really good question, sort of two on one card, but it's about um, signature verification. How did this, so the question is written, how do you verify the voter's signature on absentee ballots? What do you do with absentee ballots that do not meet signature and witness requirements? So really it's a, a signature verification question, but also a witness question. So. to say it. <laughs> no, 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 it, it, it's actually involved. Yeah, so yeah. there are, are complex rules about signature verification. Uh, our board looks at every single ballot and our staff also looks at them. So our staff looks at every single ballot. Uh, well, let, let me back up. So first, absentees are have to be requested, which um, on that, that request form, all of the information has to be correct before they even get a ballot. So it's Things are looked at then, and then uh, when those ballots come back, uh, they are uh, uh, reviewed for all of the information that is needed, the, either to witnesses uh, or a notary, that the signature's there, if there was anyone assisting that that's noted on the ballot, all of those things are reviewed. Um, and then if there are, uh, we always look for things that, that uh, would flag a problem. So if we saw the same signature a bunch of times, that would be something that we would review and bring up to the board. Um, are there more things to add? Yeah. I can add something. Um, in North Carolina, we don't verify signatures. Um, so that's not up to us to determine if that uh, voter signed that envelope or not. So I can tell you I can sign my name five different times and it looks five different ways. So it's not up to us to determine whether that voter signed that ballot or not. If state law changes, of course, that will be you know a different story, but uh, we don't go and pull their record and verify that signature. But that signature has been witnessed by two people or by one notary. I mean, they are, there are strong safeguards built into the system. And as Director Duncan just pointed out, a voter has to specifically request an absentee ballot. So we're expecting one back from them. If we get an absentee ballot back from someone who didn't request it, <laughs> we start investigating. <laughs> but uh, the board looks, at, the board in Buncombe looks at uh, absentee ballots pretty closely. And believe me, that took quite a bit of time in 2020 when we had over 39,000 people in the county vote using absentee ballots. We had many long nights. Great. I, actually, I, I, and I, and I want to make note of one thing. Director Duncan talked about a red flag. If we see the same signature all the time, um, you know, Charlie was talking about ballot harvesting earlier, and it's, it's one of those things you got to watch out for. But there are some signatures that I do like seeing all the time, and those are the wonderful people who participate on multi-partisan assistance teams, helping voters who can't get to the polls and who really struggle to vote absentee to have their voices heard. And I was so grateful to see one of my multi-partisan assistance team heroes show up tonight. Tom Reitmeyer, down on the front row here, has been doing it for years. He has helped hundreds of people. Mr. Reitmeyer, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Let me say it's a privilege to help people in nursing homes who otherwise could not get out to vote to be with them. Blind people, uh, paralytics, you know. Um, I've had one man, all he, could, all he could do was move his head up and down or sideways. And we were able to get him, he had studied he knew he was voted for, uh, and it was a privilege 
to have, have him count his vote. Mr. Ragmeyer, thank you so much. You're an election hero. <laughs> I would like to add something about the MAT teams. In Henderson County, we're a retirement county, so we have um, we do have a lot of nursing facilities. So we're real proactive with that part of the elections. Uh, we call every one of the nursing facilities in our county. We hound them until they make an appointment for us to come out and help their people request a ballot if they wish. Uh, then we uh, do make another appointment and we send our MAT team back out to help them mark their ballots. Now when we say MAT team, we're talking about uh, Republicans and Democrats. They're never alone with a the voter. They always go in a team, so therefore there can be nothing said about, you know, marking their ballot for them. We, it, we're really careful about having the Republican and the Democrat at the same time. They're never alone. So um, to me, that's one of the most rewarding parts of the absentee process uh, because they're so grateful when someone comes to help them because they've always voted and it's something that they should continue to do. So, so we really stress that in our county. That's great. And there's so many good questions here. One um, just dovetails so nicely off that conversation. Somebody asked, what about a person in a nursing home who can't walk or use a phone, perhaps, but wants to vote? And I think we heard a, a really great example of how that feels on the ground and, and these, these teams that do it. Is there anything anybody wanted to add about that, though, to help illustrate the point for the questioner? I think that was a great explanation, but. OK, great. We'll, we'll call that one pass and answer. All right. Uh, another one I think that works really nicely off of that, um, moving to the human side of things a bit. Uh, somebody says, quote, I am concerned about nefarious, hyper-partisan people in staff or volunteer election positions that should be procedural. They, they underline that, so I think they meant that word. Uh, what are checks and balances regarding human bad behavior? So hyper-partisan uh, hyper people and staff volunteer elected positions that should be procedural. What are checks and balances regarding human bad behavior? And there was a related question about the rule change that was just um, not adopted by the state, and so maybe somebody could tie that together in an answer. That'd be <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, yeah. we're, nobody's working on this alone. Um, at every election site, there's a chief judge and there are two party judges, a, a Republican and a Democrat. Uh, there's built in checks and balances. We all keep an eye on one another. And the bottom line is everyone wants the process to work smoothly because if it doesn't, telling you, election day is a long day. You open the polls at 6.30, they close at 7.30 p.m. You've already set it up the night before. You had to get up before the birds to get there on election day. One of the most gratifying things for election workers is for everything to balance when the polls close at 7.30 because then they get to bring in all their materials and then go home. If it doesn't work out, uh, it's hours and hours and hours. There's a really strong incentive for people to work together to check one another's work, to make sure that everything ticks and ties perfectly. So there's really checks and balances built in just from all the people. And having this be Republicans and Democrats, and some unaffiliated actually become election workers as well. But we get to keep an eye on one another. And within the office, um, well, I would just be real surprised if, if a staff member turned out to be hyper-partisan, uh, it would definitely be detrimental to the, to the mission, but I think it would be pretty obvious, and we would respond to that if something surfaced. Um, so two things that, that I would like to add, and it gets um, complicated because we're talking about all different types of people that help with elections. We've got poll workers and MAP members and people and the permanent staff and seasonal staff that help us out. It is an enormous team that helps. And there's a lot of people who are passionate about voting, of course. Um, so we keep the focus on that. No um, partisan talk is tolerated in our office. Um, it, it's very refreshing to me, actually, to come into the office and I don't hear any of that. It's, it's wonderful. 
Um, and then uh, as far as the poll workers, the, those are uh, uh, some of them, the, the people who work on election day are appointed positions. Um, and those are appointed for two years. And there is an oath associated with that, that they will um, you know, not engage in any of those activities. Um, and we take those things seriously. We, we, and, and we have training uh, toward that end. Yes. Poll workers are suggested and nominated by the parties. So they're political to start. But um, in the uh, election process, you can't tolerate that. Um, and if someone is partisan, they're politely asked to go sit in the corner until the polls close, and they're not used again as a poll worker. And you can't have that because, <laughs> like Corrine said, you know, you have five people, you have five different opinions. So you can't have people arguing politics all day. You have to be quiet, you do your job, and you go home. Do we have any poll workers in the audience? Work the polls? All right, whoever asked the, the moderator the question, you ask, I'll talk to one of these poll workers, they'll tell you how it's done. And actually, the best way to find out, sign up to be a poll worker. Yeah, that's, <laughs> we, we always need poll workers, always. And another thing is that there's also um, a processes to remove someone. If, if it is seen that someone is being partisan at a polling location, they're, they're, there's processes for the, them to not only be re removed, but um, have you know, consequences. There's, there's consequences for those actions, too. 1,000 pages, the Bible. And there is a big paragraph, a statute, about the, the uh, powers of a chief judge. There's something to behold. If a chief judge is on the ball, that problem will not come up in a polling place. That will be, it's called 911. <laughs> right. Sheriff, please, thank you. That's great, thank you. I've got two questions I think that tie pretty well together. I'm gonna read them both, but they're both in general about voter ID and, um, and just identifying voters in general. So one person says, when I vote, I am asked my name and address. How can I, we, trust who I voted, uh, who I am uh, in voting in our elections without further protocols. Somebody asked a, a fairly similar question with a little different end. Um, there's been a push in North Carolina re regarding voter ID under the argument of voter fraud. Is my understanding that voter, ID, that voter fraud is essentially non-existent? Is my understanding correct? So sort of two questions about the verification of voters. <laughs> Anybody else want to add more syllables? You know, when the the question of voter fraud, I mean, those of you who were around here in North Carolina in 2018 might remember what happened in Congressional District 9. Charlie was talking about ballot harvesting earlier. There was a gentleman by the name of McCray Dallas, may he rest in peace, who was harvesting a lot of ballots. That election ended up getting thrown out. It was redone. And that was election fraud. That was election fraud on steroids, and it was so bad that they, they had to do it over again. But that is such an exceptional circumstance. Um, election fraud is very, very rare. And one of the reasons it's so rare in this state is because the checks and balances are so strong. But if someone actually tries to vote multiple times or vote fraudulently, they've got to have a pretty good idea they're going to get caught and they're going to get prosecuted. So uh, the point's been made. We've got a very strong elections infrastructure in North Carolina, and one of the things it does is it helps us prevent voter fraud. I would like to add also that the State Board of Elections has an investigative division. So if anyone at the, at the county level or any, uh, any person thinks that someone is uh, committing fraud about voting twice, report it. Report it to your county board, we'll report it to the state board, or you just go directly to the state and report it. That's what they're there for. Um, and if there's enough evidence, they can turn it over to the prosecutor, and they can, go to, uh, they can be convicted of a felony. 
I don't know anybody that thinks one vote is worth going to prison or having a felony on their record, but is there fraud? Probably, but at a very, very small level. Do people cheat on their taxes? Yes. <laughs> Can they get caught? Yes. Because if you commit voter fraud, then you're opening yourself up to uh, going to jail. Uh, I think some other important things to remember, too, are that, um, you know, North Carolina, you have to be registered in order to vote. So there is that, that whole process, and there is list maintenance and all kinds of checks that we're doing throughout the entire year to keep that, those voter rolls as accurate as possible. So we're doing that the whole time. Um, and then the data is open, so you can check uh, and make sure that, that your voting record is accurate um, and, and that, uh, that your data is accurate. That, that's, that data is just out there for everyone to look at as well. And, and I second to the, um, there, there's always the investigation process if, there, if someone thinks that something uh, has happened not in the right way. Um, we have a question, sort of similar to what was asked on the last panel, but um, I think it's, it's a really important one, so I want to get the perspective of this panel on it, too. I think it's important people hear the answer. Are North Carolina voting machines connected to the Internet? And if so, what security is in place to protect integrity? That's been answered. Yes. <laughs> and so in case somebody came in late, I saw we had a few uh, folks that came in after the first panel. They're not connected to anything except the power source, and the power goes off, the batteries kick in. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's true. So the system is redundant. We've got, we have the paper ballots, and then we have the machines, and we also, the, the machines that are doing the tabulation, and then we have the check-in computers that are, are checking in uh, voters, and we have the sheets of paper that voters are signing. So we're ch making sure that each one of those balance. So there's, there's just a, a, a lot of checks and balances on that, in, in addition to making sure that things are not connected to the internet. Um, and, and results eventually get uploaded to that, but it's, you know, the, the air gap system has already been explained. But I just wanted to emphasize that, that we have the, it, it really is a paper system that is augmented by an electronic system that is audited. Great. I think we've got time um, probably for, for one more question. Can you all just talk to us a little bit about, because folks probably don't know, the role of the board versus the county director? What's the role of the board? What's the role of the county director? Why do we have them both? My specialty. <laughs> <laughs> In this book, there is a statute that talks about the relationship of a election board to the county commissioners. It is blunt. It is black and white. And you do not need a legal expert to interpret it. It simply says, my words, we are a stand alone department, the only say so in the county government, any uh, uh, organization in the county government that has any say so whatsoever and it's very limited, it is the county commissioners, they give us the money and money only to carry out our function as an election board, period. Um, you gonna add something to that? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah no, the way it works is, election services staff does the day-to-day -day conduct of the business of election services. They register voters, they, make, they fulfill information requests, they, they take care of all the nuts and bolts of running elections. The board, to a limited extent, sets policy locally. One of the policy questions that the board always has to answer is early voting plan. But there's, there's not much policy discretion at the board level. The board provides oversight to staff. Uh, we approve the budget. We review and approve the budget. We look at performance. 
And you know, earlier I talked about how stellar our performance was in 2020 when so many people registered and voted. Um, but the board monitors and supports election services staff. Election services staff does the work. The board, <laughs> the board stays, tries to stay out of the way and tries to get those absentee ballots processed as quickly and accurately as possible. But uh, it's the staff that's carrying the load. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so um, when I think about this question, I think uh, if I really simplify it, that the uh, election director and, the, and their team are running the election and the board is certifying the election. So um, the board is there to make sure, uh, to make the process open so we uh, have a board so that we have public meetings and that the public can view everything that we do. And the board tends to be less experienced than the staff. <laughs> there's a, you know, um, boards come and go, and staff is there running the election. Um, for, for many people have been um, with the team for many, many years, more than I have. Um, and so a, a fantastic benefit of that is that the, this bipartisan board is there in front of the public asking questions, asking us questions, and, and helping the public, voters, anyone uh, who, who wants to learn, uh, understand the process. So that, that keeps everyone honest. Um, and then also, unfortunately, the law is sometimes gray. And so the board is there to answer those questions and make those decisions when that's I think I misunderstood the question. <laughs> I don't think so at all. <laughs> no, I, I thought when you said board, you're referring to the county commission board. Right. So well, actually, that is an interesting point. That's only. I, I think it's good for folks to think through. There's there's a lot of different actors involved in elections mm -hmm. at the state level, at the local level, and despite what a lot of people think, not as much at the federal level. And that's, I think it's a really nice sort of place to end. So I want to thank the panelists for being here today and for doing what they do um, for a living and sometimes for volunteers. So thank you. <laughs> and we'll, we'll move to our last panel here in just a minute um, until 8 o'clock. That'll be on election law. It's going to run very similarly to the other panels that we've had thus far. I'll start off with a question, and then as fast as we can, we'll get to yours. But I do want to recognize, we're recognizing elected officials and folks running for office before. So Lindsey Prather is here, um, who's running for North Carolina State House, of course. Um, President Blakely's here, Fletcher uh, Mayor. Chuck Edwards is here for North Carolina State Senate, also running for 11th Congressional District. John Ager snuck in with a hat on, so nobody would notice who he was. But he's here in the front row, from, excuse me, third row back from the North Carolina State House of Representatives. And then Caleb Rudow is also right here with his hand up, who's running for North Carolina State House of Representatives. So we're glad to have all those folks, Republican, Democrat, running for federal office, running for local, running for state, being here. So thank you. Yeah, that's all of them are working. <laughs> and then some. Um, we'll move into our election law panel now, and I'm going to introduce Gail Kemp, who's going to come up here first. Gail Kemp retired from the North Carolina Department of Justice after a long and varied career, including being a public defender, clerking for the Michigan Court of Appeals, instructing law enforcement, and teaching in college. She's been active in politics, both as a public speaker, the League of Women Voters, and a candidate for North Carolina House in 2018. She maintains her knowledge of cases currently in the courts concerning voting issues. She's an active volunteer in many organizations in her community, including serving as the director on the board of the Latino Advocacy Center, 4-H Sewing Instructor, African American Reading Project, among others. She's active in her precinct and the Democratic Women of Buncombe County. We're glad to have her here. And last and absolutely not least, we have Bob Orr. Bob Orr, uh, a lot of folks in the room know Bob Orr by, by reputation, if not by person. <laughs> Bob was born in Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, got to Western North Carolina as soon as he could. He spent his childhood in Hendersonville, earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, served in the United States Army from 1968 to 1971, returned to Chapel Hill to earn his JD at, at UNC School of Law, entered private practice uh, here in Asheville, North Carolina, 
it goes on and on and on. But you know, things I think about when really I think yo. about <laughs> all in good ways. He's got uh, the best stories about uh, working with Billy Hendon in Western North Carolina of anybody. He served on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. In 1994, he was elected to the state Supreme Court. He is an NCAA gadfly, and he is uh, really one of the best North Carolinians I know. So we're very glad to have him organizing this and here today. So um, I'll begin with a general question that y'all could probably tee off for the next two hours, but we only have 20 minutes. So what role do the courts play in the election system and in keeping our elections processes safe and secure? Well, let me, let me just say that the, the courts are intimately involved in elections because people ask them to be. The courts don't insert themselves into elections. They're asked to, to come in. So we have uh, a prime example of a, a court involvement in a case was in 2018 when Sherry Beasley, or 2020 when Sherry Beasley and, and Newby were running against each other. And there were a couple of different ways that that happened. Um, Beasley filed a lawsuit asking that the Board of Elections, the State Board of Elections, count 200 provisional ballots that she thought she was due. Uh, and the court had to make a decision on that. And then um, the Board of Elections, on its own, went through all the processes for a very close election without court involvement. Courts are involved in other kinds of cases like redistricting, um, voter identification, but they're asked to be involved in those cases. They don't get involved on their own. Yeah, the courts hopefully are the last resort. You, you hope that the election system, the administrative process, works without having to go to court, but you see litigation on the front end where people challenge Certain, uh, a certain law affecting elections, and it works its way through the courts prior to an election. You see uh, the courts getting involved sometimes on election day if a precinct uh, is hoping to extend the hours that it's open. Uh, I've seen, seen uh, candidates go to court to try and get a judge to order that the particular precinct, for whatever reason, stay open extended periods of time. You see uh, sort of post-election controversies arising out of the uh, compilation of the votes, like uh, like the uh, provisional ballot situation. And so, you know, we are somewhat of a litigious society, and uh, as we become more polarized politically, uh, the solution seems to be, well, let's go to court. Uh, but the courts serve an important and useful function to present a finality to issues that are raised. And so you know, we, we hope we don't have to go to court, but inevitably it happens. That's great. And Jennifer Roberts is walking around collecting cards for the, the most overqualified card collector in American history. So please flag her down if you can and, uh, and put some questions in. You know, we ended the last panel talking a little bit about the different actors in elections and, and sort of said offhand, the federal government doesn't have much to do here, but, but they do have some, right? So how does the state interact with the federal government around elections? Yeah, start there. Yeah. I'll start. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there are a couple of things that the the way that our constitution is set up and the way that our, our republic is set up is that we have a federal system in place, and so federal elections are actually handled. The procedures are actually handled by the state board of elections, or in some states, it's the secretary of state is involved in that. Uh, but the but the maps for federal elections are drawn by the state legislators, and um, so we know that that we're required to vote on for presidents every four years on the second Tuesday after the second Monday, and and the states pick up the procedural part of that and and put the elections together. Uh, there, 
there's a lot of dependence on the states to do the right thing and to do a good job. Um, and I think that one thing that's important to remember is that we have three branches of government that acts as checks and balances in both the federal system and in the state system. So if, and you know, if there, for example, if there's a question about congressional maps that involve a federal election, then that goes to the federal court. Uh, if the, if the, if it's a state issue and we're talking about legislators in our general assembly, then the state court, in most cases, takes that on. I mean, there are some things that that overlap, uh, but for the most part, the states have the bulk of the heavy lifting when it comes to elections. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, I, I would say, though, the state law and the state constitution are still subject to federal law and the U.S. Constitution. So uh, you see some litigation arising out of what appears to be a, a conflict between state law and federal law. And you know, th there obviously are, are uh, federal laws passed about the Voting Rights Act, for example, things like that that, that impact elections. Uh, and if there is a violation of federal law in the context of an election, then the U.S. Attorney's Office will prosecute that case. Uh, you know, there was election fraud issues back in coming out of the 1982 election here in Western North Carolina, and that was all handled prosecutions by the uh, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. So uh, it's. Uh, you know, it, it's that constant balance and tension between the federal system and the state system. That's great. Thanks. We've got a couple of questions about redistricting or gerrymandering, so I'll just read them both. Um, how does North Carolina's history with gerrymandering affect election integrity? Has this changed since the North Carolina uh, Supreme Court redistricted some areas? And somebody else says, what is the role of the judiciary regarding gerrymandering? So. And I might think Bob would be a good person to answer this. Do we have like three hours? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, well, all right. I'll I'll start this yeah. with a chime in, Gail. Uh, there has been a great history of gerrymandering in this country, going all the way back to the very first congressional election, which I guess was 1788, uh, and. The Eldridge Gary, who was governor of Massachusetts in the early 1800s, has been tagged as the father of gerrymandering, when in, in reality, Patrick Henry, oh, give me liberty or give me death, who was in the, the Virginia uh, House of Burgesses or whatever their, their uh, legislative body is, uh, tweaked the congressional maps in that first election trying to defeat James Madison. So, uh, you know, the history, and it goes on both parties, uh, whoever's in power, there's a tendency to want to, uh, you know, have a degree of control and maybe tilt the scales just slightly in favor of uh, your political party. But uh, gerrymandering is one of the really hot issues, uh, redistricting. You know, how, how do you reform redistricting. There's been legislation introduced, you know, over the years by Republicans, by Democrats, you know, trying to come up with a, a, a system for North Carolina so that you, you don't have it. But the real problem, and, and you know, like Gail says, we can talk forever on this. Um, the real problem is that the sophistication of computer technology now is so extraordinary that the, the ability, if you want a district with 52% female, 18% uh, Methodist, uh, you know, 98% Carolina fans, you know, you, uh, you could do it. Now, it would look really weird and perhaps violate other deals, but, but the technology is, is such 
that, and again, you don't have to draw a district so that you win 70-30. You only need to draw a district to win 51-49, you know, in, in most years. So it, it, it's a huge issue. There's no simple solution. I encourage you, if you have a lot of free time, go on davesredistricting.com and you can practice drawing maps or you can see the kind of challenges. But there are certain limitations, the whole county provision, compactness, contiguity. You know, you can't, uh, the first case I ever saw argued at the U.S. Supreme Court was the old I-85 district uh, that was Mel Watts that ran literally from Charlotte up I-85 up in the, the Greensboro area and there were sure. massive parts of the district that were no wider than I-85 in the right way. Uh, so anyway, Gail. Yeah, so I want to I want to say one thing about this is and and it came home to me a couple of years ago when my sister was five years older than me. I'm 67, so she's 72. But a couple of years ago, she said to me, I don't even think that my vote matters anymore. And that's very disturbing to me because we were raised in a family that voted in every election. We saw our parents doing it. We, we heard them discuss elections and candidates around the table uh, at dinner. And so when she said that to me, it really made me think that for somebody who has reached that age of 70 and is now wondering whether their vote counts, I wonder what it's like for my 22-year-old grandson, for example. And I think, and the reason I'm talking about this now is because I think that one of the things that gerrymandering or extreme gerrymandering and you know, Bob said about, it, it can be really, really um, data mined to figure out exactly who votes and how. I mean, we're talking about who buys what kind of car. All of those things are available. And certainly, you know, somebody who has an IT background knows more about that than I do. But you, you can read a lot about it if you, if you want to. Uh, and, and unfortunately, what has happened is that if, you, if the party in power tips the scales to stay in power, they pick their voters and the voters don't pick them. And I think that's what happens with, you know, people like my sisters that I don't really think my vote counts. You know, why should I vote? Because I've seen so long where um, the, the politicians are actually drawing the maps to choose their voters and the voters are not choosing their elected officials. And that is a drag on our system. It's a drag on our democracy. And I'm afraid that if that doesn't change, that it's, I mean, it has to get better. It just has to get better. Yeah, but I really encourage you to explore the process because it really is not as simple as it sounds. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, for, a, for example, in congressional redistricting, every district at the time of the redistricting uh, law has to be the exact same number. So the district in eastern North Carolina, in the first district, uh, northeastern North Carolina, has to be exactly the same in the 11th. And you know, from a practical standpoint, it immediately starts changing uh, the day after it's enacted. But you can't just draw a district of 843,235 people. It has to be compact. In other words, you can't run it from Murphy all the way along the South Car Georgia, South Carolina uh, line to Wilmington. Uh, there has to be contiguity. You can't put part of Western North Carolina, skip a couple of counties, and throw in, uh, you know, Caldwell or. Or, or something that's not necessarily contiguous. So th there are all of these constraints, but computer technology does allow the, the map drawers to be um, precise in a really kind of scary way. I mean, they know so much about all of us uh, when it comes to drawing the district. Right, and I, I would be the last one to say it's easy. Um, 
but I think that that's, we really have to count on our, our elected officials to have integrity, to do the right thing, and to let the voters make decisions by following all the rules that are in our Constitution and our statute about the things that Bob has talked about. Um, you know, and, and I'll give you an example of a court case that was decided. Um, the court said in one case that was uh, on appeal that the districts were, were made with surgical precision to exclude and include certain types of people. And so when we're talking about racial gerrymandering um, or, or partisan gerrymandering, we have to really be careful that we don't, that we don't disenfranchise voters. And we have to do that difficult job as, as elected officials to make sure that the voters are not disgruntled. And I think that's part of why we're here is to try to make people understand how very important voting is in every election. Every time there's an election, everyone should be voting. That's a, that's a great place to end. I'll get Jennifer Roberts back up here to close this out in just a minute, but I will say uh, some questions we didn't have time for, but just so we know what's on folks' minds that are in the audience, uh, maybe you could talk about it after. Somebody asked a really smart question about partisan versus nonpartisan judicial elections. We didn't get to that one. Location of a polling station was a great question. Um, we got a question about uh, Warby Harper. We got another question about the pending suit on unaffiliated voters on this uh, Board of Elections. And we got some more questions about security improvements that we've seen in the state of North Carolina. So anyway, that's where folks' heads are that weren't able to have time to get their questions heard. And with that, I'll pass off. So we get to dodge more of the Harpers. You get to dodge. <laughs> Whoever asked that, you pin Bob War after this. <laughs> so you see what they did there, right? They left the lawyers to last. So it's our fault that we can't answer those questions. Chris, don't go away. Oh, Come back up. Uh, uh, on behalf of the over six foot tall club. <laughs> <laughs> My luck to get the <laughs> tallest mayor, ex former mayor. <laughs> we have a little gift to thank you for moderating tonight. You handled those questions expertly. And so a friend of mine who's an artist drew a picture of the bus with me and Bob in it, and you get a t shirt. All right. <laughs> thank you. Side, but I, I meant to say it a little different. I want to thank the legal women voters for putting out a North Carolina guide to college voting. This is one of the most misunderstood areas uh, out there, and we obviously have a huge number of college students across uh, the state. And this is the first time I've seen what I thought was really good, accurate information to help college students know whether they should register where they're in college or whether they should stay registered at their home. So I, I, I commend the League of Women Voters and encourage everybody to grab a copy. Yes, thanks so much to the League. Thanks to the U.S. Veterans Hall of Fame. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to the elected officials. Um, we all can make our democracy work. And it's really um, our obligation and our duty as citizens of this country. Uh, and so, and the college students, absolutely the best way to keep a lifetime voter is to start young. So keep voting, know your candidates, know all your election dates, and make sure you share all the information you've heard tonight. Thanks so much for coming. Okay.